All right, Luke chapter 18. And okay, verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, said unto him Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. May God bless the reading of his word. Bob Smack. Alright, so. This is one of those videos that I didn't really want to do, but then I felt like if I could do it right, maybe then I want to do it. So, essentially, uh, the late Ravi Zacharias, um, it has come out that he, um, you know, in, in certain news stories, that he has um, been a... Um, Oh, a sexual deviant, I guess we could say that. Um, they found his uh, cell phone with um, a lot of uh, sexting, and then they also um, have evidence that he used his massage parlor to um, commit adultery. And one lady claimed rape. Now, um... I think that um, when you hear these stories about uh, famous people, and of course there's nothing saucier than a popular evangelist uh, getting into immoral immorality. Um, you know, there's a lot of energy and things kind of go in all sorts of crazy directions, usually totally negative. And, um, you know, I see a lot of Christians reacting to this, and I think the problem really is not simply what should be done, but also how people understand things and make judgments. Um, when we're dealing with this stuff, um people are making a lot of assumptions. And when they do this, um, then they become cuckoo. <laughs> so, you know, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what do we really know? Okay. Now, I try not to invoke too many um, Christian people or celebrities or ministers or church fathers or whatever I try not to go there too much uh, when I preach now if you're a preacher or a speaker of some sort you talk a lot and when you talk a lot eventually some stupid things that are going on in your head can come out so you know, I, I went down and I looked at my Facebook and I scrolled down. And as a general principle, I also hold that you cannot know that you know that you know what's in somebody else's heart. And I've had to learn that the hard way. But uh, essentially, uh, you, you don't. You don't know what goes on in the heart of man. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, I think. If not, just read the whole book. <laughs> but uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, I think it was that uh, Paul said he doesn't even judge his own soul. And so the, the point with that is that uh, we don't really know the whole situation. We don't really know what's going on, so it's best not to say anything. And that's why, you know, I don't look to uh, people as part of my preaching. Uh, I want to preach from the Word of God and focus on that topic and hopefully not screw that up too much. But um, basically, um, 
when we deal with the church, I believe that the church can make some good judgments. Not perfect, but we can make some good judgments. The Bible teaches that, um, you know, we are to conduct church discipline. That you must have a uh, public profession of your faith. And that baptism is linked with your public profession of faith. And there are many good deeds and things to kind of introduce that help us to get a roundabout of who is Christian and who is not. But we don't have a total certainty because we don't have a total certainty on the subject of if that person believes deep down inside their heart. We've got a good understanding of how to accomplish that. Um, but even the Bible says that there were some who were with us who were not among us. And even Jesus had a uh, disciple who left the faith. That was Judas. So with that being said, um, you know, Jesus does not teach that man is good and that goodness is the way to heaven. He says, uh, what was it he said there? He says, none is good save one that is God. And by the way, he was good because he is divine. He's the Lord. He's innocent, perfect. But that is how we know this from the scripture. Yet the rich man didn't know it. And so what did Jesus do? Jesus went ahead with his assumptions and kind of tried to work him out of that poor mindset. Teach him. So he said, no one, no one is good but God. Now, um, if a you know man of God does evil things, then God will handle that person. I, I think that uh, assuming that the, the Ravi did it, um, then therefore, you know, this could be used, you know, this, this shame of his memory might be a reward that was taken away. He had a huge, uh, after his death, he had a, a huge response from people in the Christian world, and even, I think, non-Christians were, you know, very celebratory of his life. I know one fan of his was uh, the Jew, Dennis Prager. But people were working on what they knew. They knew he had died and you don't speak ill of the dead. But they knew that he did many good works. And it was a lifetime of lots of good works that he performed. He was an apologist for the faith. He was an evangelist. He was also an apologist for uh, morality and other good things and a good, godly, righteous way of living. So, he spoke those things in his word. And since few of anybody was mentioning what was going on, then, you know, people assumed, okay, he must be consistent with this. They didn't have knowledge that he was doing other things. So you really can't judge people off of what they don't know. If Ravi Zacharias was exposed years prior, then his ministry would have been, you know, crumpled. Uh, now with the situation going out, well, we have a lot of convincing evidence that he did these things. But we don't have an absolute knowledge. I wasn't there. I didn't talk to witnesses. No, I heard a, an article um, just not too long ago. It was like a couple of weeks. But I, I heard an article from Christianity. Read an article from Christianity Today. Heard some people talking about it. And um, basically, I didn't get Ravi's defense. People in his ministry did out him. So you think, therefore, well, that means he has no defense. But there's still uncertainty. Why? Because they had motive 
to survive and save their business. And therefore, in this climate of um, social justice and Me Too, they denounced him, said, okay, we give up, we denounce it, we're hiding, okay? And that is the culture right now. Say, I give up, I'm sorry, I hide, okay? And um, so, you know, you don't know his side of the story. However, he's, he'd, he'd have to have a lot to answer to, okay, in this situation. So it is more obvious that, you know, we lean towards the side of assuming that's the case. But we, we just don't know. The other issue is some of the women in these stories. I think there was a couple issues um, that were different cases, such as the, you know, there's a difference between sex thing and a massage parlor. Massage parlors, there are good massage therapists out there. Um, they're there as a business, and they're there to promote healing, uh, just like um, chiropractic. Chiropractic, you know, physically works on getting the bones in alignment, and massage therapy helps to get the muscles in a proper alignment. So, you know, that occupation is not a bad occupation, but it is an easy gateway to prostitution because they're paid for services and you know when they get those type of services often they'll you know and I don't know if this is necessary but they do you know massage people naked apparently and uh, if they're massaging them naked and you're touching and feeling the body then you know both parties might you know be tempted to say hey let's do a little bit more let's have a little fun and isn't it great that money's being exchanged? <laughs> you know, so essentially, um, there there has been a lot of a bad reputation with massage parlors too. Um, and I think it would, you know, uh, if you're having a masseuse, I think it's okay to have a masseuse, but to kind of make sure everything's you know legit down and all that kind of stuff. So that's what's going on there. But when it comes to the presentation of these women, they're uniformly, you don't know a lot of identity here, they're uniformly assumed to be innocent victims. And that is bigotry. Uh, you can't assume, you know, that people are necessarily innocent victims unless you really have knowledge of their victimhood and you know that they're innocent. Um... And where that goes is that, you know, uh, Ravi seemed to be okay height, but generally looked not much like a very intimidating figure, figure phys physically. And, you know, if he's on the phone, I don't know how he's forcing women into a situation. Um, you know, he could ensnare them. But that would assume that they'd have something to be guilty of. So why do you call them innocent victims? Um, you know, when we're dealing with the, you know, the masseuse slash prostitute, you know, if she's doing sexual things and she's getting paid for it, it doesn't seem to be like an innocent victim. Could he have taken advantage of the situation? Uh, even though he doesn't look like a very physical figure, you know, a little old Indian guy. Um, could have, could have still happened. I mean, maybe it's a little woman too, you know. Uh, so, you know, that, that, you know, there could be a victimhood of sorts, but innocence is not anywhere there. And so you got Christianity today claiming that prostitutes are innocent. And so that leads you to, you know, Prostitution ain't wrong, it's innocent, <laughs> you know? And this is very troubling, and why is it troubling? Well, obviously there's a sense of justice needed there, but more than that, if Christianity Today is leading women into sin and saying, hey, you know, if you're, 
you know, whoring yourself for money, then you're innocent. Well, that destroys any moral foundation from a Christian group of sorts. And then you have, you know, the conclusion that, well, you know, I'm a little princess. <laughs> I remember um, many years ago, I was a lifeguard and we'd have to, you know, do a lot of regulation with the pool. And one thing was no running and the kids would always love to run. And so um, I remember there was a toddler and, you know, um, she's running and I blew the whistle at her. And I was like, no running, stop running. And then she stops and she thinks about it. And it's almost like in her head, she's like, but I'm a little princess. And then she runs off. I worry about this uh, when it comes to women uh, of a secular nature, not necessarily worldview, but worldly women. Because I think the message is, is like, you know, God is your guilt ridden father, and, you know, he's nobody worth much reverence or awe, so you know what, like, he'll realize that, you know, I'm daddy's little girl and, you know, he's not going to throw me into hell just because I didn't really commit faith in his son or, you know, um, get saved from my sins or ask forgiveness or any of that kind of stuff. And so I think that, you know, there, there, there's a devil in that detail and so... Um, I do worry about a secularization of women and women not getting saved as a result. Because it does appear as if hell is something that's only promoted to men. But, nevertheless, um, it, well, I mean, you look at the culture. I mean, you know, 30, 40 years ago, women were the power of the church. Honestly, they were just, you know, gung-ho. Mama was taking the kids and boom. All right. And, of course, many men were falling out of that. They were falling for the Hugh Hefner version of atheism and being the playboy and going out and doing what they could and really leading the families into sin. So, you know, that's no good. But the, the, the logic shifts there, and instead of saying, let's both be holy, you now it's like, oh, let's switch it over. And so you see a lot of women leaving the church, a lot of women um, living more into sin happily. And um, basically just, um, you know, they're leaving their husbands and turning their backs. They're doing everything that the secular man was doing a generation before, or a couple generations before. Now it's just switched over. And so, you know, you, you worry about that. And, you know, people not understanding the gospel. Now, um, let's see here. You know, I think this is also an issue of celebrity status. Ravi had two things going for him that were just part of his privilege. Uh, he was a man who was uh, not white. And I think that um, Christians knew that if they saw a non-white intellectual, that there was a lot of public appeal for that, you know. And so... Uh, given that, that gave him an little extra oomph of celebrity status. And so um, he had become the golden goose in his evangelistic ministry. And therefore, I think that those people were protecting the golden goose. But um, basically, uh, his private life was, you know, obviously had some you know, terrible aspects to it. Meanwhile, you have a good public life. Now, let me just say this. Um, Bill Cosby had a great public life. He promoted a lot of good and decent moral things. He was a great leader of the African-American black culture and revered by millions. And I appreciate every positive thing that he brought to society. Um, but he had a private life. And so in his private life, he did horrible things. 
and that got out. Uh, and unfortunately for Mr. Cosby, even though he was way richer than Ravi Zacharias, <laughs> right? but unfortunately he also had a backlash before he died. And so last time I checked, he was in prison. He may have gotten out by now. But um, basically, decades later, you know, justice was found. Now, um, does that mean that his public work was bad? No, his public work was good. You know, and we have to be able to discern these things, you know, have a basic morality. And a lot of casual Christians don't even have a basic morality at this point because it was part of the culture. And now that it's not part of the culture, they're falling apart. And they're becoming nutballs. All right. Um, a majority of nutballs. <laughs> yeah. But still. Um, you know, so we had this kind of libertine, live in sin culture, and now we have this socialistic and pharisaical, you know, point the finger culture. And so it says, um, well, it's not saying, I'm just writing out my notes. <laughs> uh, we have a poor understanding of judgment. And as I said, with celebrities, uh, you know, the good sounding celebrities are good. No, no one's good. Yeah, you know, that's what we have to understand. Uh, and are they, are the bad sounding ones necessarily bad? Now, let me, let's think about it this way. Um, we'll go to another figure, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, um, he was born into a Christian home. But he became a Muslim, he became an apostate, he changed his name to a rich racist white man. All right, yes, the original Muhammad Ali was a white racist who uh, kept slaves, called uh, the black people the raisin heads, and made fun of them, and uh, basically denigrated uh, the African people. But, I'll, you know, uh, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, he didn't get the memo, and so he changed his name, Muhammad Ali, from Cassius Clay, who he admitted was a champion of, um, of people stuck in slavery, trying to help get them out, and promoting the Underground Railroad and things like that. So, you know, and who was Christian? But, besides that side point, Ali, um, you know, he basically represented Muslims and uh, African Americans, and he had a bitterness. Uh, he was bitter against white people, bitter against the system, bitter against America, and then he, he dodged the draft. Well, dodging the draft, um, you know, was his right to do, in the sense that he didn't feel like it was a moral war because. Those people had never done anything to him. Now, I don't agree with his logic, and I'll tell you why. Because the Irish really didn't like the Africans and the African slaves in the Civil War. Because the Irish were more poor, much more poor. An Irishman uh, would sleep on the street in a, you know, messed up looking tent on the gravel at the same time that a slave was living in a cabin. And their lifespans were cut massively short as a result of this kind of lifestyle. Well, they figured, hey, I'm an immigrant. I don't own those slaves. And, you know, they've not helped me any. Why do I need to risk my life? Why am I forced, because of the draft, why am I forced to risk my life for that guy, he's never done anything for me. Okay, so that's the same logic. Why should I, you know, be benevolent about that? And that means that under Ali's logic, they would have never been freed. Okay. So, you know, I don't agree with his logic, but I understand his argument. I understand it's honest. 
and that many people would say, why should we go to war, period? Why should I kill somebody? And I'm not even a part of this conflict. That's, that's a rational understanding, and he should be free to it. Um, but, basically, um, that's kind of the, the, the problem with the draft system. Well, nevertheless, um, he did good things for African Americans, and he did good th things for Muslims. And generally, um, you know, a lot of people look up to him for that. It's a little different if you don't, if you're not part of the constituency. Okay. But generally, he's still doing good things for people. I've done good things for people. Okay. I have done some good things for black people. I'm sure Ali did some good things for white people. But generally, you know, people just don't understand the nature of helping people out in good deeds. It doesn't matter if they help out somebody you don't like. So, you know, he was seen as righteousness among his constituency and that he was such a good man. And I can recognize that. Then, uh, you know, when he died, and, and, you know, I think I wrote an article talking about how he was a great man. Okay. I didn't say he was good, but I said he was a great man. But when he died, then you have um, some people coming out and they said, look, Ali was a sexist. And that is a common charge among Muslims. Look, Ali was homophobic. Okay, that goes, that goes along with his faith. And, you know, um, but basically he's a hero among people who are usually kind of voting Democrat. All right. So, you know, they're looking at that. And they're judging him by the left leftist standards. And basically, um, you know, you don't look at somebody for the wrong they did. Also, he did, I, I do believe he had an affair. But um, you don't look at somebody for the wrong he did. You look at somebody and say, what can I learn from their positive good deeds? Okay. This is kind of the situation. Um, I respect... The teaching that Ravi Zacharias did. I did a worldviews class when I was in my early 20s, and I found that this college course, that cost about 800 bucks, was not as in detail as the half hour program that I was getting uh, every Sunday morning. And so, you know, I do appreciate that he did hard work as a teacher and he did okay as an evangelist. But that does not mean that I look to him as some sort of idol. And this is where it really hits, because there are people talking about how, like, well, it makes you doubt your faith, and blah, blah, blah. Like saying, like, yeah, somebody did some wrong, and I doubted my faith. And then somebody did wrong, and they doubted their faith. That has no, um, that is completely improper. You know, that has no business in the thoughts of a Christian. Why? Because we are never to idolize. You shall have no other idols before me. We should not look to people, especially because of celebrity status. Yes, they go out and they give, you know, a message. Maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, you know, and there are lots of people that you might not like that have done good things and you just didn't know it. And there's lots of people that you like who've done bad things and you just didn't know it. Um, but that should have no wonder, you know, Jesus never said, hey, you know, you join me, you'll be a good, perfect person. That's not the message. The message is that you're a sinner. And so if I see somebody in sin, well, there you go. And I think that also celebrity is something you have to watch very closely. It's a very big temptation with um, ministry. You know, don't get me wrong, most ministers are not rich and famous. And I think that does help out when it comes to those type of temptations. But, um, and also, we're going to have a celebrity status if we have a message that's reaching out to a lot of people, and we do want a message that reaches out to a lot of people, 
So there is a temptation, but you have to kind of keep a good network with the local church. And I think that if you have tons of money coming at you, you have to be very careful about how much money you keep, Mr. Minister. Um, I don't want to put a, you know, exact price. There's many different lifestyles, many different, uh, you know, regions. You know, some, some regions that you live at don't have the money. Some regions that you live at have all the money, and they're going to cost a lot more to live in. So, yeah, there is some flexibility. But um, when you have a, a huge amount, and you'll kind of know, you know, I mean, like, if if you're, like, living at a level that none of your congregation could should ever achieve, Okay, they, they, they could not live your lifestyle. There's a problem. Because you can't deal with their temptations in life. Because you're rich. Could you be earning a lot and then giving it out? Yeah, that's possible. But, uh, and basically also, I think that if you're earning a lot of money, uh, you might want to be earning it from something outside of church ministry. That, that's also an issue. But yeah, and, and so and that, that's not as a rule, but it's just general wisdom. You know, there's there's got to be a place that, you know, okay, I'm not going to go past that point. And there's also ministers that have a way of manipulating the situation. They'll say, oh yeah, I'm not getting very much money, but yeah, my church worships the ground I walk on, and the church has a limo, and they run me around in it anywhere I want to go. <laughs> you know, so you gotta watch out about that, and any anybody with celebrity status, I mean, like, politicians, you know, we see politicians in these things, and I remember uh, one was they were uh, attacking Governor Mike Huckabee, because he was a Christian, so they were attacking him on uh, expenses, and it's like, oh, well, he, uh, his family chowed down on food that was um, uh, from a campaign or something, and so they were eating out at the Chick-fil-A or something. And it was like, all right, well, I mean, they might, you know, they might kind of work that out internally, but that really didn't belong on the news. <laughs> it's like, they ate money, they had a burger. You know, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, but generally, uh, when we see these things, uh, we also got to remember: um, don't Christians don't need to be judging non-believers at the same level? If non-believers are not committed to God, then they're not going to be under you know the law in that sense. Now, the law is good for teaching people that they're spiritually sinners. And if the government, if the culture does adapt to those laws, well, yeah, okay, now the culture is adapting to the law, and then they have moral responsibility. But, you know, that doesn't mean that, like, you know, people with no clue, you know, are going to be treated in that way. Jonah was mad at God for... um you know, um, having mercy on the people in Nineveh because they were pagan. And God said, look, they don't know the right hand from the left. You know, so these, these things do need to be considered. And we should have proper judgment. Right now, we have this judgmental society. The culture's doing it as a reaction. The culture went through a lot of extreme hedonism and abuse of liberty. And so because of that, the culture is reacting the other way. And the communists that are running our society knew how to manipulate the situation. So they're pushing it with leftist value. And they probably did help to encourage the temptation of Christians. But nevertheless, um, that's that's the that's the fruit, okay, of some of these deeds. 
And, you know, we have to say, look, all right, we do agree with your responsibility. You know, um, there should have been some church that Ravi was going to that kind of said, look, there's something going on here. You know, maybe um, the ministry, maybe the family, go talk to the church. That's what the Bible says. You take it to the church and the church deal with it. And then they could have dealt with Ravi on those issues. Uh, instead, they're playing into like a Me Too cycle. And, you know, it's just righteousness without wisdom. There was a um, passage that was brought up in a uh, Facebook. And I wanted to kind of show this because it was ironic. They were trying to attack it and attack the Bible, but. It actually makes a point to what we understand today. And that's in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Verse 17. All right. Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Let's see here. Mm. I'll go up earlier. Uh, 7.15 All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. Where is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness? And there is a wicked man that prolong his life. In his wickedness. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise, why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish, why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this, yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Wisdom strengthened the wise more than the uh, ten mighty men which is in the city. For it is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now, basically, um, the way I relate this. They, now, when Ecclesiastes is written, it's... A type of wisdom literature, but it's closest to philosophy. And in this philosophical style, they're really thinking to come up to a conclusion, not necessarily shooting conclusions the whole time. But essentially, what he's talking about is that there's a priority. Okay, So if you say, for instance, that, um, oh, what is it? Trying to figure out why he's there. China is an unrighteous nation. You say, well, they're unrighteous. We got to do something about this. And then you decide to sail off into the ports and say, okay, China, I'm going to stop you from all your abuses. Well, then you get killed. <laughs> you just will. And you're not going to accomplish anything. Okay. Because you took a, you took things out of whack. You had no priority. You know, maybe you should have spoke out. Maybe you should see what I can do that would work. But, you know, that is where we say they'll be righteous over much. Um, we don't have to make the world a perfect place. Because we're going to go to heaven and then Jesus will come down and then make the world a perfect place himself. Um, so we have to, we have to be careful about that when it comes to judgment, you know, uh, oh, well, we'll find everything bad that somebody did. No, <laughs> you know why? Because you just make a bunch of enemies and then, uh, everything just falls apart in chaos. And that's basically what justifies murder. Well, I saw it wrong. And I'm going to take care of that. But, obviously, um, you know, we don't want to go the other way, where we're so merciful that we 
become the friends of the evil, and not just friends, but we become the soldiers of the evil army. And I am just doing it so that those pharisaical Christians, blah, blah, blah. No. Don't be, yeah, don't be wicked over much. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll catch you later on Bob Smack. <laughs>